and to bring real glory to your name. In the name of Christ we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Finally, we lift our prayers for healing, both of the body, for our loved ones, and the larger community of humanity around the world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the way of peace. We ask you to come into the brokenness of our lives and our land with your healing love. Help us to be willing to bow before you in true repentance and to bow to one another in real forgiveness. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, melt our hard hearts and consume the pride and prejudice which separate us. Fill us, O Lord, with your perfect love which casts out fear and bind us together in that unity which you share with the Father and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen and amen. I want to speak this morning about good news. Psalm 92, 96, verse 2 says, Sing to the Lord, praise his name each day, proclaim the good news that he saves. This advice from the psalmist is hard to hear while 2020 is still ringing in our ears, isn't it? Good news. I mean, after all, how do you say good news when people are being carried off to the hospital and the morgue is so full that there's a waiting list? Now, on top of that, the November election results are, according to whichever extreme point of view people might choose, it's either a fraudulent stealing of the pres presidency or the liars are attacking our democracy. Um, whichever side you may lean to or be fully on where that's concerned, your eyes might be glazing over at this point. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I get to the point where I just can't bear to hear one more bad thing about coronavirus or the election mess but I want you to know that this verse, Psalm 96 and verse 2, has much more hallelujah than hell for us today. So the last two words that the psalmist offers should give us a hint. What does it say? Proclaim the good news that he saves. Saves. To be saved is to be rescued, is it, is it not? It, it's to be plucked out of the danger. John Wesley talked about being pulled like a brand out of the fire. Uh, if you know the story, the Wesley brothers grew up in a parsonage. Their father was a preacher, and uh, one day the parsonage was burning down, and Wesley was rescued at the last moment. So he felt like he was a brand plucked from the fire at the last moment, just the opportune time. Well, to be saved I don't know if it's ever happened to you where you were on the brink of death in some way or brink of disaster in some way, but if you've ever been saved, then you know what the word really means because you experienced it. You had a sense of uh, you were doomed and now you were saved. I had that experience as a young child, um, just not more than 12, 13 years old, I guess it was. I was climbing up a tree because my father getting to the point where he didn't want to climb trees and he had a son that was beginning, going to be a teenager and so he would send the son up the trees to do what he needed to do. And there was a dead limb that was in danger of damaging one of the cars and so he wanted to cut that limb down and he sent Russell up the tree. Russell cut the limb down. It took him a while. It was one of those big limbs. But about the third or fourth swipe on the branch and here comes a swarm of yellow jackets. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I picked the wrong branch. I should say my dad picked the wrong branch there. I think I told the children when my dad was here that this was the meanest man in the world. That, that's what I had in mind. But my dad said when I looked down, because I was gonna jump down, because you do anything you can to get away from a bunch of yellow jackets, right? He said my face was covered. And he couldn't see my face because all those bees were all over my face. I had stung more than a hundred times and spent two days in the hospital, thank you very much. But there was one point where I lost consciousness. And if it had not been for my dad being there and carrying me to the doctor, I would have been dead. 
There's no question about it. You go into anaphylactic shock when you get stung that many times. And you, you don't die from the venom of going through and doing something to your heart. What happens is your air passage cuts off and you suffocate. So uh, this is a very real thing that the psalmist is talking to us about. God, the Lord, saves. And this is good news. What does it have to do with the mess that characterized 2020 and seems to offer very little hope for 2021 at the moment? I mean, we have a vaccine that's being distributed, but where's the hope for 2021? Where's the good news? If he saves two, what are we being saved to? And if he's saving us from something, what is it that we're being saved from? Well, the short answer that I have this morning is that we are being saved from ourselves and from our selfishness. And to call a spade a spade, we're being saved from our sin and being saved to his presence where there's safety and peace and joy forevermore is what scripture tells us. But short answers are always by nature somewhat simplistic. It's, it's surface stuff and we need to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so I'm going to give us a thesis bone here for us to pick on this morning. You know what that means, a bone to pick on? You give it to the dog and he's going to wear that thing to death, right? Well, my thesis is a statement and you might agree with it, you might disagree with it, you might change your mind sometimes uh, in the middle of us talking about it and chewing on it a little bit. So here's my thesis this morning about the kind of mess that the world is in and what kind of a year it was and what kind of a year that we have to face here. Here's the thesis. 2020 was a test. And it is a test. And the rest of the story is, it's good news. You say, wait a minute. 2020 is good news? Yeah, it really is. And I base it on what James, the brother of our Lord, said in his uh, epistle to us in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Listen to what James said. Don't try to turn there. Just, just listen for a second. He said, he wrote down, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way. Have we had any troubles in 2020? I mean, you know, just say election, say COVID. And, you know, you've got enough to chew. That's enough of a bone to pick, isn't it? He said, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Troubles and great joy. Does that seem like oil and water to you? Those two don't mix, do they? But yet James says, that's what it is. This is an opportunity. I didn't say it's full-blown great joy. What he said is, it's an opportunity for great joy. And here's why. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your faith been tested this past year? I want to tell you something. If it hasn't been stretched, you haven't been paying attention or you've been living on another planet. It's something to stretch. I mean, everything has changed. Look at you. You're all wearing masks. I mean, when's the last time you did that prior to 2020? In church, you never did. That stretches your faith. Fact is, we haven't had services a number of weeks this year because of 2020 and what happened. He says, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. What is endurance? It's patience. It's resilience. That's inner fortitude. Your endurance has a chance to grow. And then he says, surprise, surprise, so let it grow. For when your endurance, your patience, your inner resilience is fully developed. Catch that phrase. Fully developed. Mature. Grown up. You will be, King James says, perfect. Everybody that's married knows that no other human being is perfect, right? Here's the point. You will be perfect. You will be mature. You'll be grown up. Your inner resilience will be full grown and useful, complete, needing nothing. Now I added an awful lot of words to what James wrote there, but they're all related, aren't they? 
is to give meaning to what James said to us. And Jesus warned his disciples that it would be that way, that in this world we would always have trouble. Didn't he say that? And he said we would have trouble even if we stick close to him as, as a shadow. Jesus probably gave an eye roll when he said that to the disciples because sometimes we have trouble because we are following Jesus. Did you ever stop and figure that some of the reason that there is so much trouble in the world is because some people follow Jesus, some people hate Jesus. Some people follow God's holy will and God's holy word because they love God, because God has loved them and they've experienced the cross and they've experienced forgiveness and they love God and others who have not experienced that love and who have not believed in Christ, they despise it. So Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in this world. Here's the good news about being that kind of follower who gets clobbered by COVID-19 or elections that seem to be controlled by Darth Vader a jealous co-worker who lies to the boss about you, or a bully who just picks on you for being a Christian. Jesus knew it would be that way. And he's already made a pathway for the good news to travel your way in the midst of the difficulty. John 16, 33 is where Jesus said to his disciples, here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but, the good news, take heart, I, have overcome the world. Jesus has an answer for everything that we have been through in this past year and in our entire life. So knowing that we're always being tested in one way or another, we have a strong hope, I think, for, uh, for which to face 2021. And that being settled, we should let our endurance, our patience grow in any opportunity for great joy. So the question for the follower of Jesus, in light of all of that, the question is not what's happening and why do I have to suffer like Job? That's not, that's not the question we ask. It's more a matter of figuring out how I can recognize tribulation for what it is, a test, and then live my life so that my walk with Christ will bear fruit for his kingdom. That's the real question. It's not why do I suffer? It's how can I honor Christ in the midst of tribulation? And isn't it grand that we had this question before the house this morning? Because my good friend, the Apostle Peter, has more than political talking points for that. He has a few life handles for us to grab on and grow in our patience or our endurance. I want to give you three of those life handles very quickly this morning about how to navigate the troubled times in which we find ourselves. And they're from 1 Peter chapter 5, starting at verse 6. First life handle that we find in troubled times is humility. You say, whoa, wait a minute, Russell. Humility? How is that an overcoming thing? How is that strength in troubled times? Well, listen to what Peter says. Verse 6 of our text says, So humble yourselves, he said it again, humility, right? Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Now, we're all about remembering that verse. Cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. You memorized it in King James, I did too. All right? But how did that all start out? Uh, how did it all start off? He said, so humble yourself under the mighty power of God. To be under anything is to humble yourself, to put yourself lower, right? What Peter says to us is humble ourselves under the mighty power of God. Listen, if there's one person who knew something about learning humility, it was Peter. You remember him, don't you? It was Peter. He was always the one speaking up and messing up and giving Jesus a case of indigestion. Peter eventually learned humility when he stood before Jesus after the resurrection. Remember at the shoreline there at the fish breakfast that they had? And Peter asked Jesus, what about, what about John over there? And Jesus had asked him three times, do you love me? Peter learned about humility because he found out that he was forgiven. 
that's what placing yourself under the mighty power of God is all. The mighty power is that which created this entire universe that we know of and much more we don't know anything about. He created all the heavens. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of it. But it's also the mighty power of God that did what? Brought Jesus out of the tomb on Easter morning. And so to place ourselves under his power is a smart thing because that power is greater than anything in the universe. The reality about this in troubled days like we've been seeing recently is that the power of God is ready to go to work on what ails us in our homes, our business, our schools, our government, if we'll just get on our knees. That is where the mighty power of God comes from. You remember the formula, 2 Chronicles 7, 14? You could probably quote it with me of my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. What is that? That's putting yourself under the mighty power of God. That's what Peter was talking about. And he says that God said, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Humility is our first life handle. And then the second one is kind of a companion to it in troubled times, spiritual warfare. Now, the one, humility, hardly sounds like warfare, does it? But spiritual warfare is not like guns and blood and killing the body. Spiritual warfare is protecting the soul. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says this, Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Everybody knows he's the evil one, right? He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. That's the spiritual warfare. It's not so much interceding for your neighbor. That's true. You, we need to do that. That's part of spiritual warfare. But the greatest spiritual warfare is for the believer to stay alert because Satan is always trying to clean our clock. Isn't that true? You know, Satan may not have been able to keep you from getting saved, but he wants to make sure if he can't keep you from going to heaven, he wants to make sure that you don't take anybody else with you. He wants to limit the damage. So, Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. This is some place of a life hand, something of a life handle that uh, unfortunately many Christians bypass or just don't know much about. Spiritual warfare is a matter of trust and worship. Did you know that you cannot separate those two when it comes to God, trust and worship? If you're going to worship God, you have to trust him. And if you're going to trust God, you will worship him. See how those two go hand in hand? I know people who worship fishing, uh, racing, NASCAR, uh, playing golf. I mean, everything else comes second to those passions with some folks that I've met that way. And the same can be said for many other uh, vocations, games, whatever. But when anything, anything at all comes before God, if you don't place God number one in your priority list, a follower of Jesus Christ at that point is not really a follower or a disciple. He's merely a fan. He's somebody who likes Jesus, but not enough to worship him. And that sets us up for a, uh, that sets us up for that prowling evil one who's looking for a Christian dinner. Folks, if we're going to be ready for spiritual warfare in troubled times, our prayer life, our study of scripture, our worship patterns, and our sacrificial love of people is going to have to look more like first century, not 21st century. Life handles, we've got two of them so far, humility and spiritual warfare. Number three in troubled times is family strength. Now I know if I say family, immediately you're thinking, well, on the first pew, we have the powers. On the second and third pew, we have the chief family. We've got Jim and Hayden back there. We have Carol over here. Those are three family units, aren't they? Well, I'm talking about that, yes. And the Bible is talking about that. But we're talking also in a larger sense as well. Hang with me here. Look at verse 9 with me if you have your Bibles open. Remember that your family of believers all over the world 
is going through the same kind of suffering you are. No expression that's big in my family. You mess with my wife, you have messed with me. You mess with my children, you better be ready because I'm coming for you. You know, this this is uh, this is one of those things that is a is a truism in most families. We stand together with each other. But this last life handle is connection with God's people. Uh, I think that's the primary focus of what Peter is saying here, particularly the one certainly in your own home and in your own church and in your own community. So where would that be? Well, the family is represented here, the community in which we live, Bennett, I live in Thomasville, uh, the church, Mount Zion, Hudson Hill, whatever the church is. But also what Peter is talking about is around the world. He said, people who are part of your family are suffering the world over. That's why we can't, we cannot afford to be tunnel vision inward turned. We can't afford to ignore Africa in favor of Bennett. We cannot afford to ignore what's going on in the world. The church is taking a huge hit in the organizational sense. Buildings are largely empty these days and closed. Programs are on hold. Budgets are getting tighter, but the worship and the witness of true church is unaffected. What do we mean by that? You say, Russell, you know, we you said it yourself this morning, preacher. You know, we've had uh, a number of times, a number of weeks during this past year when we didn't even have service. We had a resort to going online to uh, to have a worship service. And, uh, you know, it's just not the same. It's true. It's not the same. But the worship of the true church is unaffected in this way. Two thoughts. First of all, you can take the believers out of the buildings. And I want you to know they will not meet. They'll not miss a beat worshiping and serving the King of Kings. That's the truth. You take the church out of the building and the church will be the church. Jesus' church is not tied to a building. If you take make-believe believers, pretenders out of the church, people who attend church, if you take the make-believe believers, the pretenders, out of their buildings and the programs, you've taken away the only Jesus they've ever known. Anybody who knows me knows that I love words. I love reading. I love learning ways to communicate so I can do a better job of sharing God's Word. I have belong to a couple of websites that uh, are devoted to helping your vocabulary. And I get a new word in my inbox every day, all right? One day this past week, I got a new word I'm certain most of us have never encountered before. I never encountered, I never heard this word ever used. It's a slang expression that's used mostly in Great Britain. You ready for this? I mean, you need to write this word down. This is an important word, okay? The word is cottywampa. And I roll off the tongue, cottywampa. C-O-D-D-I-W-O-M-P-L-E. Cottywample. How many of you used that over breakfast this morning? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Cottywample. It's so alien to this U.S. brand of English that we use, my spell checker didn't even recognize the word. What it means, here's the definition of it, it means to travel purposefully, on purpose, toward an as yet unknown destination. Where are you going? I don't know. Why are you going? I'm going. But where are you going? I don't know. That's Cottywampo. That's going someplace. You don't know exactly where it is, but you know you're going there. Okay? Do you know what that is? That is exactly what Paul wrote to the Hebrew Christians about serving without seeing first. Here's what he said in Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Where are you going? I don't know, but I'm going there. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You heard the expression, the just shall live by faith? To Kadiwampo is to know that you're hoping to go where God wants you to go. And he's going to leave you there. 
the evidence of things not seen is that deep down understanding that when you do trust and you do worship, God will lead you there. That's who we are. How many of you have seen God this week, this month, this year? How many of you have ever seen God in the flesh in your whole life? How many of you have ever met somebody who's seen God? No, we haven't. It's all by faith, isn't it? But somewhere deep down inside, there is the evidence of things not seen. Example of this would be the meaning of faith. It was by Connie Wampole that Abraham obeyed God. You remember the story? Abraham was getting on in years. God had promised him a son. Finally gave him a son when he was over 90 years of age. Getting on to 110 years later, the boy Isaac has grown. Abraham is 100 years old, and God tells him, go offer Isaac as a sacrifice. What did Abraham do? He moved toward the destination that he did not know what was going to happen. That's Cottywomble. Abraham loaded the backpack with firewood and a sacrifice knife, and he headed out from Mount Moriah with Isaac in tow. It wasn't an easy time of it, but his faithful moving towards the mountain, Cottywomble, meant the power of God was carrying him through. Peter's life handle for troubling times. Humility under the power of God. Staying on alert in a spiritual warfare sense. And counting on the family of God everywhere to be part of God's basic instruction moving you in the direction that God wants you to go. These are the ways you do what the psalmist said to sing to the Lord, to praise his name, and to proclaim the good news each and every day. This is how you build your endurance and experience the ensuring peace, the joy of God's presence each day. Listen to what Peter said would come of all of that. We're still in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 and 11 says, In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. He called you. What does it mean when you call somebody? I called a Kenneth. I said, Kenneth, come on over here. What am I asking him to do? I'm asking him to make a journey towards me. When God calls us, that's the same thing. He's calling, Amy, come, take a journey towards me. He's calling Hayden, say, take a journey. He's calling Carol, take a journey toward me, God says. God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So, after you have suffered a little while, I think 2020 qualifies, we've suffered a little while. After you've suffered a little while, he will restore and support and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. See that he ends with a doxology. That's the way our life ought to be. Beloved, while COVID and the political and economic crises are cleaning everybody's clock these days in the U.S. and around the world. Believers who have learned to cottywomble to God's will, to journey towards God, a place we've never seen. Those people are excited and looking forward to his next chapter. I want to tell you something for me and for you. That's really good news today. Let's pray together. Father, help us to never lose sight of the direction to which you have said we're marching all the way to Zion, that city on a splendid hill where there's a temple made without hands, the doors are open and unguarded, and the light of your welcoming glory are always on. For the glory and the honor and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let this be so in each of our lives, we pray. Amen.